Mm. <laughs> not that kind of conversation you want to have. <laughs> no, no, of course not. Of course not. I mean, we're live. We're live. Well, we're streaming this live. Uh, thank you for everyone. This is our, our Crest Chat, our first Crest Chat of 2023. Uh, we're starting our series um, this quarter. Is talking about um, business strategy, entrepreneurship, leadership, and uh, and we're we're gonna have for the next quarter. We're gonna have these these pretty amazing topics and things that we're we're working through. And tonight's topic is uh, dreaming, setting goals, and executing habits and practices. Right, and uh, and so I've got some amazing men here, and. Uh, Blaine, how do you say your last name? Buxton. Buxton. So I always see it, and I, and I, I want to say something else every time. So I figured I would have you introduce your last name. This is Blaine Buxton. I got it. I got it. You have to talk in the mic. The microphone is direct in front of you. That's how. So you're very smart, but you know, some of my other smart friends, I have to, like, the most simplest thing, I have to explain it. That was a joke. Okay. Well, I brought it closer anyway. Oh, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. So, Blaine, tell us what you do in a nutshell. Who, who, who are you? What do you pro- professionally? Where are you from? I'm a software architect um, for a fairly big corporation, and right now they're trying to make themselves a software as a service. Um, I went and got my master's degree. Um, I've had it for a couple of years now, and I just it wasn't my midlife crisis as my mom told me it was. Um, it was something I've always <laughs> wanted, and I never had the time. Um, so I got that and um, came on doing the job I am now, doing you know some of the hot, exciting machine learning and you know big data stuff. Yeah. And, and uh, throughout my career, I've always gone uh, with whatever's interested me. So. That's awesome. So you you, you just move with what? In- now, what is the difference between a software architect and a software developer? More meetings. <laughs> No, really. <laughs> That's it. That's all it you, is. You draw, you draw more diagrams. More, di- <laughs> more meetings. More meetings. Yeah. Guys, this is how you do it. Actually, um, uh, unlike other software architects, I, I do get a, a good amount inside of what's going on day to day. But, you know, mm-hmm. I'm also drawing, you know, a lot of diagrams, lots of meetings. Um, a lot of mine is just letting people know what's going on and all that. That's but. all. I did just get a text message from a very rude person in the back running sound. Uh-oh. And he said, have them put the mics in front of their face. <laughs> is this good? That is. That is right there. Right How's there. this? That's perfect. That's perfect. Now, I, I, I like didn't this. say that. I got the text message that said that. And they are so <laughs> rude. I was enjoying this conversation. And apparently people want to hear you online. Is this being recorded? <laughs> yeah. Is it okay? I guess. All right. All right. Because if it wasn't, we would just say it's not. And then hope you wouldn't see it. Okay. And then, and then I get muted. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right, so so you're a, you're a software architect that has a ton of meetings. Normally, That's what yes. we got. Yes, it's, you know, a lot of communication. No. you got to make sure everyone knows. It's really about setting vision and then having um, making sure everyone communicating that everyone knows what that vision is. There's also a good amount of getting down into the weeds, so to mm-hmm. speak, um, and helping people out. It's a lot of mentoring. Do you have, a, um, like, a team of, of younger – like developers underneath you that are just coding and and creating this machine learning language and all the above, right? Yeah, correct. Creating so solutions, yeah. So you're you're in like a leadership role in this company. Correct. Got it. Got it. So you and you help them kind of process through and set these targets and deadlines and and just just like I, like you said, like a mentoring, get them going. Yeah, get them a, going. Sometimes you know, get in the weeds with them, and you know, if they have a pretty thorny issue, you know, like oh. I I can't figure this out. You know, we'll get together and uh, we do what's called pairing, and you get together with them and you sit down and you problem solve, which is one of the things I actually do enjoy about this job is when when you do those kinds of things because you can help somebody, and a lot of times it's also showing people things they may not have thought about, and that's really cool when when you show something to somebody and they're, and they're just like, oh, I never thought that could be a solution. Yeah. Right. That's what I love about tech and like what you do for a living is you're literally solving problems. You're taking this idea that seems you know, 40, 50 years ago or 20 years ago, like this was sci-fi, right? Like not like so far from reality that people were coming up with these ideas like talking into watches and, you know, like Star Trek. And like those were like just a thought, an idea. And guys like you made that just 
through, I think I can do that. I can problem solve this. Here's a problem. How do we now create a solution? And I just love that you you guys do that. You guys, in that you're, you're a leader in that space. I think it's just a really, fa I just love the tech, like tech guys. You guys are really cool guys. So. Oh, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I've, 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 like, I've, I know. I'm, I've always enjoyed tech. And yeah. to me, the first time, you know, I was introduced to a computer, um, they were trying to show me games and all these things, and I, I was like, yeah, that, that's that's cool. But the minute someone showed me, um, he printed my name on the screen and then had it repeat over and over. He programmed it live in front of me, and I was like, I just looked at him and said, how did you do that? And he started showing me, and I went, that's what I want to do. In fact, they made my dad that day go buy me a book on programming. Wow. Didn't even have a computer because they were very expensive. Yeah, so that was um, a, immediately a dream. You're just like, I'm going to do this. I, I can point to that yeah. moment as the moment of going – that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. And from that point on, I've been obsessed. Yeah. You know, my wife will tell you that. And, you know, I mean, I got my master's at 50, so. Yeah, yeah. And that tells you how dedicated. That's amazing. <laughs> and it still seems like magic to me a lot of times. A lot of times we do things, it's, I still have that element where I go, wow, that is really you cool. You did just introduce, I said, now explain, explain to, to him what you do. He goes, I do magic. <laughs> I love it's that. Like, it's like that's the best way <laughs> that I can even describe what the internet is and all these machines. It's just magic, you know. Um, how would you describe this to a person a hundred years ago? Like what you do? It would be that magic. Exactly. And that's it. It's just like, a lot of times people think that's that's what you do, you know. And yeah. my my big thing throughout my whole career has been a lot of times tech people will get into the to the vocabulary, the jargon, and, and they use it to confuse. And I've spent most of my career trying to tell people that are not familiar with tech, you know, um, what's cool about it. Yeah. And, and not to confuse, but to educate. And so my big thing has always been about education. Yeah. Um, to make it less magic. So when I say, you know, a joke, oh, it's magic, it's uh, it's really a, a joke yeah, on, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm – you know, on other people trying to confuse or what have you, but, but I really try to break things down and I truly, really try to make people understand, you know, what it is I'm doing to make it less magic. Yeah, yeah, so. I love that. I love it. And then to my right here, I have Corvelli McDaniel. Now, today is a special day. We'll deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> but aside from it being a very special day today, which we are so grateful that you're here today. Glad to be here. You're 25 years old today. <laughs> 25. I love it. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. Happy birthday. I feel like Happy it. birthday. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that you would grace us on your birthday. It oh, just means miss so it. much. Corvelli <laughs> McDaniel, let's talk a little bit about you, because you guys just love talking about yourselves. You, you just tell, <laughs> just like, they're, just, they're super comfortable talking about this right now. So, what, like, what, so again, today is we're setting, achieving, have you achieved dreams before? Oh, yes. Yeah. For sure. Right? Yeah. I mean, just dreams and you set goals habits all that i've i've seen both of you guys in action and i'm just very impressed by it. so so just talk about a little bit about your background this is your second crest chat mm -hmm. you're on the very first one about financial literacy and that was the wild was west awesome. this is still the wild west but that was like <laughs> that's how i knew that we we're gonna keep doing this this is even no one says that we're gonna have some fun and uh and so just yeah for, for those that, that don't know who you are just what do you do um, a little bit about your background I work uh, from history forward that uh, I'm a former Army intelligence officer, uh, as counter counterintelligence special agent, and I spent about seven and a half years in the military and most of that time overseas doing some pretty tough jobs. You know, I'd, my first, uh, first job was uh, an assignment that most intel officers would not take, and that is to go and work with the infantry, you mm. know, in the front lines of uh, Germany. Uh, where uh, you're sure to get muddy boots and, uh, and, and some tough sledding. So I did that and uh, went on from there to Panama and was a company commander of a counterintelligence company uh, in the aftermath of the U.S. invasion of Panama. And so I was doing uh, intelligence work on the front lines and then a real-world scenario uh, and uh, enjoyed that. But my wife uh, explained to me one day that we were expecting our first child and I said, you know what, this is a good time to get out of the military and <laughs> transition. I guess after the invasion of Panama, I could see the handwriting on the wall, that there would be more uh, activities of that nature. Just saw that coming. And so it just was a good time, a good decision for us. And started working at the Treasury Department as a security specialist initially. But then I worked my way up from, you know, support positions to 
more the uh, frontline business of treasury. You know, they you know, reached a point in my career where they were like, well, you know, if you want to do more, we'll give you an opportunity to lead a business function, uh, over-the-counter revenue collection, about you know, $150 billion in, in revenue on an annual basis. That was the way to cut my teeth on real revenue collection and treasury work, and I did that and worked my way up in different divisions and uh, ultimately became the, uh, the global leader of the revenue collection business for the government. That's about $4 trillion that flows into our government every year. Uh, and uh, uh, around the globe, major responsibility. And even after a long s a time of service at the Treasury, uh, I decided I wanted to do something different. And as God worked all things out, I, I'm at, at Citibank now mm -hmm. as the uh, Chief Administrative Officer and North America Region Head for the HR, or Human Resources Shared Services Organization. And uh, my wife and I relocated and been at it for a couple of years now in Tampa. So, yeah. And that article you sent, I always like to, like, oh, we're honors dude. You made history. I did. You I made did. history. Yeah, I was uh, uh, the first uh, African-American male or female to have the position of being responsible for the nation's primary revenue stream. And uh, I'm honored to be able to say that. I thank God for it. But, yes, we can look back over the course of, of history, and I was the first. That's amazing. I'm just so proud of you. Thank you so much. For just yeah. everything you've accomplished. And then knowing you and what you're desiring, and that's what I love about you. That it's still, you've done so much, and you desire. Like, I'm still dreaming. I'm still I'm shooting for the stars still. That's, yeah, I you believe know? I still have more gas in the tank. Yeah. And want to, uh, you know, I've figured, hey, I've, I've done the military and the federal government and now corporate America. Still want to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So uh, give it up for these guys. They're awesome, right? Yeah. That will conclude our chat for the night. I'm <laughs> just... <laughs> yeah. These guys are amazing. That's all you guys needed to hear. Um, no, go talk to them. No. Um, we are really going to kind of jump into this first question. And um, basically, I'm going to say, uh, let's, let's go to Blaine. In your own words, what is dreaming? Oh, um... Hmm. They don't know these questions, by the way. This is <laughs> literally just the conversation I, like we're hanging out playing I tennis with our words. I actually them beforehand. But I know uh, you did. I know. This is the joy of this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even have all of them before. <laughs> I had to go to Corvelli. Corvelli, I'm stuck. I'm like, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I guess dreaming, I mean, I mean, if you could think about it like, you know, your nightly dreams or the, the dreams that you have for yourself, you know, the goals, mm -hmm. the ultimate goals you want to, you know, strive for. Um yeah, well, that, what is dreaming? Yeah, I mean, we define it like yeah. we define it in the English language for our culture. To me, it would be used. like goals for yeah. me when you when you say dreaming. You know, yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, t to me, um, uh, <laughs> the dream I had was to work with computers. To me, that was coming as a kid from Alabama. I didn't know anyone that did any kind of engineering or any kind mm. of um, technical stuff, and. Um, for me to be able to do that as a job, you know, and not work at the local Kmart or what have that that was mind blowing to me, and that's why I worked so hard in college. And then when I attained that that dream, it was like, okay, now what do I want to do? You know, and then I started um, when I got out of college. I kind of happened on um, a team of really bright guys, and I was like, I want to be like them. And then I found who they admired, and my dream became, I want to go work with the guys they admire. Mm. And that's the way I go with things. Um, I just, it, you know, it's kind of like I, I, I set the, the, the dream and the, and the goal are it. And then, you know, I try to go for it. I don't always hit it, but, you know, I, you know, I try to enjoy the journey, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're setting it, right? And so, so you're living your dream. I'm still on the journey. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> that was the whole point, though, <laughs> is that you're living the dream of, a, your dream, your dreams grow. Your dreams adjust. Your dreams change. You have a dream tomorrow, yeah. but you have actually lived your dream. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm living the yeah. dream of, of yeah. As a kid, of what I wanted to do, I get to do. I get to work with computers every day, mm -hmm. um, and and do and do what I love. As far as you know, that is. Yeah, that's. You know, I I, I look at it this way. Um, I I did a lot of, um, you know. Um, Jobs like working in fast food, 
Um, I used to clean like the Burger King broiler. Mm -hmm. I used to do that. And I look at it this way. Any job, the worst day that I have right now at my job is better than it, the best day at, at those jobs. And those were the ones that made me strive forward because I was like, I'll do this because I have to get to it to get through it. Mm -hmm. right? Perseverance, yeah. You know, and that, I think that's why it's always good to have um, dreams and, and goals and kind of start going, this is, a, and to, but to also to en enjoy the journey. Yes. Right? Yeah. Because, and, and, yeah, go ahead. you know, your goals, are, your goals and dreams are going to change. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, um, I went for one dream and I got so close to it and uh, I got, uh, it got taken away. Nothing happened on my end, but it was just one of those things that, you know, life happens, things change. You know, I was like, okay, I was, I was crestfallen. And then I was like, you know, okay, now it's time to level set and say, well, what's the next thing I want to go for, right? But that's the whole thing about enjoying the journey. If you're enjoying the journey, mm -hmm. when you have those setbacks, yeah, they're depressing. But, uh, you know, you can go, well, I'm enjoying the ride so far, so uh, let's, let's pick the next place to go. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I actually said this on this week's podcast. I had Dr. Carlos with me. And um, – I pulled a line from Todd Hopkins, who was a guest for our last grass chat, and uh, he I, he calls it living in the gap. And um, so many people they're chasing the horizon, like you, like our how our dreams function and work is that like you buy your dream house, you're in it. The very first thing you do is you roll on the fresh carpet that's in there. You know, it's, and it's just here we are, and you stand up and you go to the window and you look out. You've been in this beautiful dream house. You I always thought you'd want. And you look out your window and you see a bigger house on the hill. And you go, one day, I'll live in that house, right? And that's a true story. Like Todd actually knew a guy that that, that was his. And then it was like, oh, and it was just so many people live in this place of living in the gap, chasing the horizon, and then they live extremely unfulfilled because their perfection keeps going. And and John Maxwell says celebrate progress over perfection, which is now become a really hot topic, but like, that's what you're talking about. It's all about the journey, having an attitude of gratitude, hitting, they're looking in the rear view mirror and going, wow, I set this dream, right. or I got this close to this dream. Man, that's, I can't believe I even got that close. Just having that like, wow, I'm enjoying this ride. Right. And, yeah. you know, and that allows you to just get back up and keep going. And that's, that's at least, you know, what Todd was talking about. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love when he said that, living in the gap, that's what causes this place of like, oh man, I'm just unfulfilled. And sometimes it's a matter of enjoying when you do hit certain um, you know, goals to enjoy it and not to always be striving for the next, you know, the bigger thing. I think a, a lot of times people are trying to strive. They, they get to one place, and like you said, like the house. Now I want the bigger house. And sometimes you just got to enjoy being in that house and also knowing that you're very privileged where you are. You know, um, my daughter has a special condition where we've had to go you know, to a lot of children's hospitals. And I used to tell my wife, if anyone's ever um, you know, feeling down about where they are in life or w what's been given to them, go through a children's hospital. Mm. And you see children that are grateful and the conditions that they're in, and, and they're happy. And, and mm. you look at them and you go, you've been given a, a bad set of cards, and you see that they make the most out of it. And it, to me, it was so inspiring to be around some of those children and talk to those children because by any standards, people are like, you know, you, you want to feel sorry for them. But they don't feel sorry for themselves. Mm. They go, this is what has been given to me, and I'm going to make the best of it. And some of them are the most happiest mm. people you'll ever meet in your life. And to me, that's like, okay. It was little babies. It's little it's, children. It's, it's level setting. And it's yeah. one of those things where you stop looking at the bigger house. And mm. you go, you know what? I've had a lot of luck with what I have. I've had a lot of hard work. You know, yeah. and, you know, I've I've been gifted this. And, you know, one, also make the most out of it, right? Yeah, of course. It's a very grateful. Very good perspective to have. And uh, Corvelli, same question. In your own words, what is dreaming to you? Yeah, it's uh, really having something with, I say something, right? I'll come back to that. Something within you uh, that is really so aspirational, uh, so motivating that, uh, and so, at least on the surface, unattainable, yet you're, dry, you're driven within to, to try and attain it. It's, 
it's having that vision and that uh, special outlook on something you want to attain uh, that's uniquely placed within you. Mm. My dream will be different than your dream, mm -hmm. but uh, I do believe all people, this is my perspective, that all people uh, have a dream within them. Uh, it's just circumstances and environment that may uh, tamp that down or, or uh, cause uh, difficulty in, in expressing it and, and going after it. But the human being is so, so uh, built with so much capacity and talent and uh, creativity. Uh, I think there's a dream somewhere within everybody. But my definition, something special within me that I want to do mm that may be unique to me, but it's so pressing within me, uh, and yet so big and potentially unachievable, that's the dream part, yeah. that, that makes it aspirational. Yeah, something I don't know you've how gotta, this some, Yeah, it's on, you, something you, you've got to fight for it. Yeah. yeah, it's not easy. A dream is not easy. Yeah. I like his answer better. I like, I'll, I'll take his answer. Yeah. That? <laughs> I like your answer better, man. <laughs> I liked them both. I'm just <laughs> sitting here and enjoying I can't believe I'm up here with you guys. A dream come true. Dreams. Right? So 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 then how how do you do that? How do you actually like the practical? How do you how do you dream? Like that's those are the definitions, right? Living in the moment, going out, like setting these targets, going for them. But how, how do you guys practically dream? Is there a process? Is there a system? Either one. Yeah, well yeah. I mean it's it, you know, the the uh the process then becomes a little more formal, right? You go from the the abstract and the, the creative part to more of the how can I do it part. And mm. there's where you have to have, I think, more of a, a uh, an approach. Yes. So if the question is, hey, yeah, I have this aspiration for a dream and, yeah. and launching a dream, then we have to go from the, the dream and the vision to, all right, how will I get there? Map mm -hmm. it out mm -hmm. uh, in a way that uh, you know is is more formal in, yeah. the, in the in the approach. I guess in a in a roundabout way, it's you know how will you plan to get there? Mm -hmm. You know what's going to be the method to achieving this big dream? Roadmap, right? Yep. How about you? You have any special method that you do just to check up on your dreams or to see how you're doing on your dreams or? Well, as far as like setting dreams, to me it's kind of having loose expectations because every time I've had like a dream or something that's kind of, you know, hit me, it's been something that I didn't expect. Yeah. Like having the, the computer salesman, you know, just show me a program. Like how mm. did he know how to program? How did he know that was going to be the thing that excited me? He didn't. Mm -hmm. he, it's just one of those where I saw it and my brain went, yes. And it, it's been that, that way. A lot, a lot of my goals have been like that. It's mm. like there's that moment. It crystallizes it, and then it's a matter of making the plan to get there. You're like, okay, how do I get there? You know, how do I work with, you know, um, you know, how do I work with the giants that I admire? How, how do I get there, you know? You start know? asking questions, right? You start laying it out, like, all right, so I'm going to go after this. Uh, this is, a, uh, this is a, I've been inspired, right? Something has to inspire a dream, right? Something externally, you have to be influenced in some facet. Yeah, so you kind of have to set yourself up for expectations. A lot of times I, I see people have too strict of expectations when they enter in new situations. And sometimes mm. if you just don't have those and just kind of go with the flow, sometimes you can find things that, you know, are new to you that can, you know, like excite you and, and say, well, this is something I, I, I want to go forward with. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, it's like when you hear a new piece of music that's exciting and it might yeah. be not be something that – you would normally like in a genre you would normally not like, but someone plays you a piece of this music. Well, that's that's kind of interesting. I'll I'll keep listening to this, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's it's kind of like that. And then, yeah, like you said, you you got to have a plan. Like once I learned, once once I knew I wanted to program. Okay, how do you do that? Okay, let's. I, you know, I made my dad go buy a book, and it's called mm -hmm. How to Program Basic. I mean, I had two kids on it, and I was like, okay, that 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 tells me something. And I remember I was writing in notebooks. I didn't have a computer. So I was writing in the notebooks, handwriting, going, well, if I get a computer, I'm going to change this. And then it became a I, – I became completely self-taught. But then when I started talking to people, like, oh, you can't be self-taught. That's not how you do this as a career. And I was like, okay. Um, and I didn't know too many people that, that did this for a living. So um, 
at the time I was, I was, uh, some I, grew, of the I, most I, grew, I grew up in Auburn, Alabama around the university. It was some of the so most, was, most like successful developers are self-taught in some degree, right? Yeah. But yeah. again, this is Alabama. <laughs> I, I was, I was around professors because yeah. yeah. it was Auburn university. So a lot of my friends, their fathers were that so they were like oh yeah you need a you need engineering that's what you need and you need the degree because at the time that was what the expectations so are like okay i need a, i need a degree so my plan was okay i'll get the degree and then i'll go out and you know and get a job and you know it was just like one step at a time okay i'll get the job you know then i'll, I'll do this and then by not having huge expectations or i won't say huge but just trying not to expect too much when you get into new situations. Like the job I went for in college was not the job I got. They hired me to, get to work in a completely different programming language. They switched everything out underneath me, and I went, uh-oh, guys, this is, not, this is not what I wanted, right? But it turned out that that's how I got on the team of the really bright guys and changed my next goal, where if I would have gone – Nope, I don't want this. Mm. This is not what I signed up for. Instead, I went with it and go, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with this um, and, and, and see how it goes, right? And I think any situation like that, sometimes even if it seems bad at first, if you kind of sometimes stick with it and say, okay, I'm going to lower, not lower my expectations. I shouldn't say that. But just <laughs> kind of go in with an open mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, be open. So you're, your dreams are, are not written in stone. And, yeah, and know, and know yeah. that each stage that you get, you may not even get to that goal. It yeah. may even change in the middle, and there might be sub-goals. Yeah, well, there absolutely are. So th you know. this is like one of my um, hot subjects that I my life is built actually on this subject. I Every November, I, I, uh, I've started doing this thing called a dream line. Uh, and I, I actually self-created it sitting, you know, I think I got 27 years old, 26 years old, sitting in a coffee shop. And I was just feeling a lack of motivation, a lack of direction. And I just sat there on my computer and I said, all right, 10 years, I'm just going to do this. And it was just out of like desperation because I felt stuck. And so I began to practice this. And the first thing I did, and I have this whole template. I can send it to you guys. It's actually really cool because then me being a strategist and underwriter and all this stuff, I've actually, because I'm, I've been consistent with actually r dreaming and then measuring my dreams through these different practices and processes, which then will kind of get into like the goals and habits of actually. I've actually had a 40% return on my investment year over year on my dreams just by being mm -hmm. intentional. It's like, oh, I I, yeah, I'm, in 10 years, I'm going to, it is good. No, I will send it to you. It's, oh, it's so good because it's like, that's how much I believe in dreaming because I go, what, and the, how that translates is I'm going to get to this point. It's an impossible thing by year 10. And by year six, it rolls around and you surpassed it. I go, whoa. And you, but you're looking back and that's that gratitude. So you don't get so caught up in the gap, right? right? Because those dreams just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You go, man. I couldn't believe that this was a dream six years ago, yeah. right? And you go, I, that's, that was so small. And now look what we've done. And so it's like uh, what I always do for me to, I, I think as people, it's all about setting the position of your mortality. Like time is my most valuable resource. And I, did, I need to respect it with everything in me because I don't get it back. Every second I spend, it's gone. And so you look at it, and I go, so I always start with my dream line now. And I won't spend too much time on this because I want to hear more about you guys on stuff. But my dream line, I always start with my age and my wife's age and my children's age and my parents' age 10 years from now. So then I fast forward. And like this last year was like, okay, I'll be you know, 44, turning 45. I'll have a 19-year-old. I'll have a 16-year-old. <laughs> I'll have a 13, almost 14-year-old. I'll have a 11 and a half year old. And then that reality of my circumstances dictates what I want in life and what life looks like. And then I don't start with money. I don't start, I, de I define my, my dreams for my family. And it goes, I'm going to be dating my wife once a week. 
we're going to be doing quarterly trips, just me and a kid, you know, for as long as I, and then you just start building out, like, what does your dream life look like? And out of that, you go, all right, then, all right, then my health, what's my health? In order to achieve these dreams, if I'm hiking regularly with my daughter and my sons or teaching my son how to drive, getting my daughter into her first year in college, right? Those, that was, like, sobering, right? You know, because we talked about it a little bit yeah. today. I was like, it's like, man, like, I just did this dream line, and I'm like, you in 10 years, your, your daughter's about to start college, you know, in, in the next year. And we're just like, wow, we just had such a, a fun bonding experience of just like remembering you telling bedtime stories. And I was like, oh, yeah, I need to, I'm embracing that, you know. And that's what like reality, like the reality of like I have to have, I have to have dreams. But I also have to understand like what is life really going to look like because that's going to dictate my actions. So we'll, we'll kind of get to this point because it goes from, for me, it goes five, 10-year dreams and there are these beautiful, rea- like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, but it's all built around my family and what I'm trying to prioritize based off of the season I am in life and there in life. And then it goes down to, you know, five-year dreams. And then I hit two and one-year goals. And then we have these different processes into, you know, half H1 goals, monthly goals, quarterly goals, those type of things. That's my rhythm that I've created to, because it's so valuable to actually set a target, to actually end in, but to get it down to three items every single day and measurables, right? And that's kind of like segueing in. How do you guys, so we, we talked about achieving dreams. It's being inspired by external positions, looking forward to things that today we see as almost impossibilities in some degree. And you're going, I don't know how, like there's no clear path to get there. But I do know that I'm going to now draw this back into like, like what you were talking about, like what I was talking about, is now we're setting goals, that we can kind of see as this is this is going to be very hard to do, but I can actually see a critical path, and that's actually what what we what I call it is a, criti- a critical bridge, like and it's your actional movements to achieve goals, because your goals are more like I, I I could see how I can get to this. The dreams are like I know it's out there, but I I actually don't know how I'm going to get there, but I I do know kind of my close step, my closest step. Does that make sense or no? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, so, so how do you guys determine a goal in your own life? We'll, we'll start maybe with Corvelli. How do, you, how do you determine a goal for you, yourself, your company that you work for, all the above? Yeah, it depends. Uh, You've got to step back to the mission. And mm-hmm. let's say in this case it's the dream. What are we trying to do here, yeah. right? And uh, the goal then has to uh, you know, be directly connected to it. Mm-hmm. So goal over here, yet the vision and, and dream is over there won't get you there. Uh, so it does start with clarity about the, the uh, you know, the objective, the dream. Oh, and I'll say this, that the dreams are special. I think that uh, they have to be protected, right? Uh, uh, and, and so jotting them down, dream books, dream boards, all that uh, is, 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 is very good. And then socializing it with people you can trust. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's enough... I guess uh, Joseph comes to mind in the Bible. There are enough, mm. um, you know, cases in point where discussing the the, the dream too too broadly mm-hmm. uh, could could draw difficulty for you. So oh, you have to have that kind of nurturing of it and protection of it, just as an aside. But um, that's a good word. It's wisdom, right? But uh, I, you know, the goal first of all it has to be written in a certain way where. It it uh, it's a value. So, uh, from a textbook standpoint, goals are to be uh, specific, measurable, uh, achievable, relevant, and time based. They should be written in that smart format. And uh, if they are written in that format, the odds are, yeah, you can really now measure progress toward the goal. So, can you say that again? Sure, goals goals should be written in a, a smart format, and they, it should be uh, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time based. Um, and therefore, th- you've got a, a goal that you can really, you know, that has some some uh, some soundness to it that you can you can tell. Hey, am I getting there or not? Mm. Uh, if the, if it has those attributes, mm-hmm. but. It's all a part of a plan. You know, goals are one thing, but yeah. it has to be connected to a broader plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there may be four or five goals to get to the, to the dream, six or seven even. Mm-hmm. 
but it has to be in unison with a with a uh, an effective plan. With the end in mind. Yep. This is where we're. This is where. This is where we're going. This is how we're going to get there. Yeah. Um, I I've spent a lot of time writing plans and uh, yeah. over the course of my career. Um, and there's some other former military folks here that I'm sure would can uh, can appreciate uh, uh, what I'm what I'm about to say that. Uh, did a lot of planning, a lot of war planning, to uh, support a lot of military operations, and uh, there is a great degree of effort that must go into the plan if you're going to have the success at the at the back end. A lot of a lot of effort on the front end, with uh, analysis and and uh, and study, and you know, in the in the military we had. Uh, a process we used, intelligence preparation of the battlefield, where it w it's a, sy a systematic approach to looking at an environment uh, and really analyzing it in a way that it, it maximizes uh, in terms of information for those making decisions, it maximizes their chances of success, uh, especially commanders who have to, mm. have to fight on the battlefield. Um, so it, it has been, um, you know that that years of doing that uh, and really analyzing you know, situations and putting plans together, it it uh, it, it was a, a a major part of my early career. Mm -hmm. So and it has followed me this planning business. Yeah. And um, some organizations and people do it well, some don't. Uh, What's the differentiator? Like how do you determine if one's doing it well and one's not? Yeah, the quality of the plan itself, how much of an investment they're making in that process, you know, uh, and how committed are they to it? Uh, how, how much of an investment do you really have <coughs> writing it and then seeing it through? Mm -hmm. So the difference is some organizations uh, understand it at a certain level but aren't wholly committed. Mm. Uh, and I guess that could be the same for, for uh, individuals, you know. It's a matter of commitment and, and uh, writing it well, taking the time to really invest in writing it well. That's, that's some nuggets. I mean, that is, I'm going to go back and rewatch that. <laughs> yeah, what are you, Blaine? How, how do you determine a, a goal for yourself and for your company? For me, it's, uh, well, I kind of resonated with what you said about making attainable and something you can measure. Um, mm -hmm. For me, I mean, my thing has, you know, at, at each point in my life, life it, you know, the th things have been different, right? Like I said, I didn't have the expectations. It's been something that's excited me. So my goals have changed yeah. um, through time. Um, sometimes from so the passion is a play in it. Yeah, but um, but writing it down yeah. and making sure that um, you know it's attainable and measurable. That's one of the mm -hmm. you know the things of you know I've always had like the longer range plan, but then I always look at the steps. But then always have that you know like me saying, okay, I was degree, and then it's like okay, now I can get the job, right? And then I got the job, and I was like, oh, well these guys over here are really cool. Um, you know, an another one of my big things uh, that I've tried to obtain in my career is I've always been going after AI, and people think that's crazy now because it's so uh, common. And we hear in the news, you know, about ChatGPT, you know, it, it taking over in the robotics. But uh, a lot of my career was in the a what was called the AI winter, where if you even talked about kind of AI, people were like, no, 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 we don't do that. That's that's old technology, um, even though. Even the technology we use now, a lot of it comes from the AI research from, you know, many moons ago, even, you know, before the 60s and things like that. So it's one of those things where that's been one of my long-term mm -hmm. goals, and I've been taking it at steps. Yep, there's been side steps, but that's why I like having it, like you said, write it down, you make it measurable, you make mm -hmm. it attainable. You know, what, one of my things that I would, um, one of my life goals, I, I don't know why I have this, but I want to be a researcher. I want to get my doctorate, you know, I want to write. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason why I got my master's at such later stage of my life is because, you know, I'd had my career and I was like, you know what? I now finally have time 
to go get it. Let's go do it. And I got it and worked at the same time. And, you know, I've had a couple of years off now. And then I'm kind of, you know, talking to my wife going, hey, maybe I should <laughs> uh, get my doctorate. And, you know, she's like, you know, she not, nods and says yes, but, she, you know, she knows the time it took to get the master's, and she's, I think she's kind of going, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe a little bit later. Maybe the AI could write your uh, your your thesis yeah. for you. But, you know, it's one of those things where I'll get there eventually, and if, if it means, and, and right now the goal's always been, you know, I can get that, uh, you know, when I retire. And to me, retirement's not quitting working. To me, retirement's like going, okay, it's kind of like, Another one of my goals is, okay, retirement means I have enough money to live off on. Now I can really go after the things um, that may not, you know, because being um, a researcher, having a doctorate and teaching, you know, unfortunately doesn't make as, as much money as it should, in my mm -hmm. opinion. So it's one of those things where, you know what, I'm going to go do that. I'm going to help teach kids robotics and things like that. That's kind of like my dream is, mm. you know, one, make tech um, – just not as magical, yeah. yeah. You know, have it, you know, to where everyone can understand it, because I, I think it can be, and and there's been things um, to do that. So yeah, so yeah, <laughs> getting back, you know, make it attainable, make mm -hmm. it measurable, but also you know, be open to have it allow it to change. Because sometimes, you know, you're introduced to things like I never thought the AI winter would ever change. Like, if you would have put me in a time machine ten years ago. And said, oh, yeah, neural nets and all this stuff will be the hot topic. You know, we're talking about it on news and we're talking about AI writing students' research papers and, you know, just crazy stuff. Um, I, I would have just said, there's just no way. That, that'll, that won't happen. But I kept going for that. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I think one of the things I also wanted to bring up was, you know, you mentioned wanting it, right? Um, you know, when you're going for a goal, you got to have that commitment, right? You know, one of my things is, you know, how do I know I want something is if I'm, I'm told no. No, you can't have that. And s when I was a kid and someone said, they, I was told no several times. You can't be a computer programmer. Mm -hmm. You can't be self-taught. You can't, you know, like I was denied being on the computer programming competition team the first time through um, because I was self-taught. Well, I went on to win the state competition yeah. that year. And they put me on a secondary team, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, it, it's things like that. And my parents even said when I went to go to college, they sat me down. And this is for real. And they said, you know, this computer programming thing, it's kind of, it's, it's a fun hobby. Um, but you'll never make any money doing this. You should be a doctor or a lawyer, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I was like, nope, this is what I'm going to do. And if this means, you know, th if this means I'm not making, the money never mattered to me. And I also view that as in goals. You got to go after the things that make you happy, right? So that's also why long-term teaching and researching is, is, a, is a huge goal of mine. Mm. Yeah, goals have to be, um, it's more, it's goals, but it's, you know, there's more to the, the process, of course. You gotta back those goals up with, you know, with, with, uh, with metrics, mm -hmm. right? Have some targets uh, by quarter or by, by month, by year, so you can really track progress. And certainly action plans, all right? Have three uh, action plans that are gonna drive progress toward the goal. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a process, the action plan development. Yeah, of course it is, uh, yeah. And, and so all of that has to be working together to, to really achieve that, uh, that ultimate goal or, or vision. Yeah, and I, you know, for me, you, when it comes to, I always feel privileged in my life to be at the age I'm in and to have achieved some of the dreams that so I do, and there's something that re resonated is every big dream that I set and every goal that I set, there was always somebody that said, you can't do that. That's foolish. What do you mean you're going to go become a recording artist? You'll never make any money of that. You'll never do that. You'll, you won't be successful. And, and, and you, oh, what are you talking about? Then you, be, then you do it, and that same person or people goes, when you go to do something else, you know, I'm going to lay this down. I'm going to actually do this. Are you kidding me? You know what you just done? Yeah, you know it's like, don't ever do that. Don't lay this down. You're getting, you know, and then you, and they're like, oh, that guy was so foolish, right? And they're like judging you this entire time based off of their, you know. And I think it's like like achieving greatness, whatever, however that's defined in your life. Um, there's always, in my opinion, a majority of your relationships, if you're not careful, 
that will hold you back from pursuing that simply because it's beyond their comprehension to even think that way. You have to oh, protect, I, protect the dream. That's for it. Sure. Right. It, it, it requires some guarding. It's just the nature of things. It is. It does. And sometimes you have to go, you know, right you have to go it. with your gut. I mean, yeah. Yeah. W- with anything, you know, sometimes you have a lot of naysayers that will try to, to say, no, you can't do that. Um, uh, just recently, uh, last year, I was diagnosed with diabetes. And they just called me up and said, guess what? You know, your, your sh- blood sugar is out through the roof. Uh, go, to, go pick up your prescription. And I thought, you know, I'm going to go pick up a prescription. Yeah, I'm going to go pick up some pills or something, right? No, it was the shots and everything. And I had been reading a book called uh, what, what Makes Us Fat. And I was thinking about doing this diet because I, I was overweight. And I was trying to figure out, okay, um, I'd been trying to count calories. I've been trying to do Weight Watchers. I've been successful before in those. But all of a sudden, you know, you get to a certain age, and all of a sudden, none of this works anymore, right? What used to work in the past. And I said, you know what? I'm going to try what said in this book, which was, you know, I've talked about this with you. You know, it's a low-carb, no, no sugar, you know, don't eat starches. Mainly eat your protein, you know, eat your meat and veggies. Um, and a lot of people, like when I first got diagnosed and I told them, they're like, oh, this is the diet you've got to have. And all their advice uh, was helpful. But a lot of it, when I told them what I was going to do, they're like, no, 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 no. That, that will not work. Um, you know, that's totally the wrong way. Well, I lost 50 pounds. Um, I'm no longer on my insulin. Congrats. Um, and hopefully Congrats, June man. of next year yeah, is I'm going to try to do the remission. But what I'm saying is, you know, you're always going to have people that say, no, you can't yeah. do that, or that's the wrong way of going about it. And sometimes when you have measurements, I can go back and say, these, these are my measurements. My measurement was my weight. My measurement was getting off the insulin. Absolutely. Right? And being yeah. healthy. And now I feel like a hundred times better. You know, my diet's Congrats. a lot better, you know, and things like that. But I'm, just, but I'm just saying, you know, a lot of times if you've got that measurement and you can look at it and you're like, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to try this because, you know, everyone's body's different, right? Yeah. It's one of those things where everyone's different. Everyone does different things. They might, which, whichever way. I, I never, you know, usually I try to listen when people give me their goals or, or whatever they're trying to do. And if, if it's something I don't necessarily agree with, I might go, well, that's interesting, but I still try not to judge. <laughs> I might go, you know, don't judge that, but but don't naysay it either, right? Oh, no, you can't do that, mm-hmm. you know, because I've had enough people tell me no to where it's like, you know. Yeah, me too. You almost yeah. like, okay, well, I'll just try it. Yeah, with the music stuff, my parents were also very <laughs> anti that. I remember, you know, when I was, when I was like seven years uh, old, Kiss came on, and I said, I want to do that. And I remember my parents took all the Kiss records and all that mm-hmm. away. and Burned them this, all. <laughs> yeah, to this day, if I tell my mom I'm playing guitar or something, she'll go, you're not going to quit your job, are you? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the whole thing was just to play music. Let, let me say this. I have to, uh, if you don't mind, I want to get a jump on Black History Month. And it does uh, kind of, it supports this whole uh, discussion around great aspirations and, and planning and goals and the like. So, again, a, a jump on Black History Month. One of my heroes is the great author Ash. And... Um, uh, in 1975, he was about to turn 32 years old, and um, he, he knew that at that age, he wouldn't have a lot of other opportunities to play in a major tournament, win a, win a major. And so he got into the shape of his life. And uh, ultimately, he made his way to uh, Wimbledon and got to the Wimbledon finals and uh, had an opportunity to play Jimmy Connors. And uh, Jimmy Connors was the number one player in the world at the time. And essentially the proverbial baddest man on the planet when it came to tennis at that time. Uh, He had only lost like four matches that year. And at Wimbledon in 1975, he hadn't lost a set. And so um, here he is facing Arthur Ashe in the finals. And the night before the finals, Arthur was there with one of his good friends and um, his friend was like, what do you want to do this evening? And Arthur Ashe said, well, I want to go to the Playboy Mansion. And his friend was like, you want to do what? I want to go to the Playboy Mansion and play a little blackjack and just uh, get a table, kind of a booth in the back, have dinner, and nobody will even recognize that we're there. And Arthur Ashe was was really great at, at strategy, and so they – took some time over dinner, he and his friend, to map out how can we best 
play Jimmy Connors on grass court? How, how, what would give him a hard time? So they mapped out a couple things on the back of a piece of paper, which so planning does not always have to be very formal. Yeah, it just yeah, has yeah. to be yeah. effective. He's in the Playboy Mansion in, in London uh, the night before the finals, and he's just mapping out how he's going to uh, beat Jimmy Connors. So the first thing was uh, take the speed off the ball and hit to Connors' forehand softly. Uh, Jimmy Connors was a power player, and so he fed off of pace. The harder you hit it to him, the harder he hit it back. He, that he fed on that. So take the pace off the ball, uh, hit the Connors' forehand slowly, number one. Number two, uh, serve him wide to the deuce court so that he would have to go way out to, to return, and then it opens up the rest of the court to volley. That was number two. And then three, uh, use the lob extensively and take him off his rhythm. And so uh, with those three things, he got to the finals, and, you know, he was up. Uh, Mr. Connors had lost two sets before he knew it. But then, of course, being the number one player in the world, he got his act together in the third set and, and beat uh, Arthur Ashe in that set. You would think, though, at that point, you know, th the average man or woman, you're facing the number one player in the world, he just got a set on you. you <laughs> it's human nature. You revert back to what you know, all right? You, you, you abandon your plan, Yeah. all right? Yeah on uh, the big stage and under the pressure, but he didn't. He stuck with his plan, Arthur did, and, and uh, he won Wimbledon. And uh, there has not been a black man to this day to win Wimbledon. Mm. The, the Williams sisters, yes, and we applaud them. But a black man, no. But if it had not been for the plan. thinking it through with yeah. a basic plan, I've been involved in a lot of plans. I know Kim has, Kevin has, others in the room, major plans, voluminous, and uh, they, they don't get executed. Mm. He, he executed it because when you MC his interview, it was like, he said, to, I have the plan, but can you do it? That is the question. And so he stuck by uh, his game plan and, and, and achieved something that nobody else mm at least a black man, has done. It was just amazing wow. to actually see the match and see the strategy at work. What do you think of Mike Tyson's quote? I think it's very you – I'm glad you about? said right, that right. because Every, I think you're – Everyone's think got a plan until they get, to, punched, to in they the get punched in the mouth. Yeah. yeah. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. There's a lot to that. He got punched in the mouth, right? <laughs> he did. Yeah, like, you know what I'm saying? Like when tennis, he got punched uh, in the mouth. Oh, right? yes, that Lost third one. set. You know, Jimmy Connors got himself together. And so now you're looking at a so now how determined do you compare opponent. So two – they seem like they're polar opposite. I think they're probably almost the same, like this, a coin, each side of a coin. Yeah. How do you how do you define that? Mike Tyson, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Yeah, it's it's uh, planning is one thing, reality is another. Mm -hmm. The the reality of life then creeps in and is staring you in the face, giving you body blows. You don't have to be in the ring, but just in life, mm -hmm. it 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 is true. Yeah, we get punched in the mouth every day, right? There's, there's always Humanity. some challenge or distraction or yeah. difficulty uh, or unexpected news mm -hmm. that uh, will cause you to abandon that plan yeah. and figure out you know, how, to, how to get it done. That's not necessarily a good thing, right, to abandon mm -hmm. the plan. Yeah, you got to know when, though. Like, sooner or later, it's information that goes, all right, let's, that's why this gets so complex within a process and a thinking. Because and so bringing it back into like, this final like talking point, and we can have some conversations with everyone else here, is is it's walking through the ebbs and flows of planning, of of how do you structure, how do you execute your habits to achieve your goals, how do you actually execute your plans, and like and your dailies, like you know, like because you're absolutely right, your measurables, your KPIs, your key performing indicators. That's what we're working through. You know, and, and personally, like, we're realizing we have to do this every single day of our life as a team. And my team knows, and we're trying to get better in our rhythms, but they report on two things every single day, simple things. Then on Mondays, they report on seven things. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we have these daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly measurable movements, and we're trying to get even better 
that's why this conversation is such a good conversation, even for young guys like us. And because it's totally different in, when you're solopreneuring or doing things in a certain way than when you're entrepreneuring and you're going, oh man, there's a bigger, the ship's bigger than it was before. Before I could get lucky and I was a speedboat. Now I have to, if I'm really trying to achieve this target, this measurable, I have to be tracking it. So what are some of you guys' practical movements every single day that, that, that someone like some real nuggets that you have of your own, we know that successful people are, 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 are self-disciplined, right? They're disciplined in, in thought, they're disciplined in action, and they're disciplined in, uh, in, in, in well, what is it, the three Ds? You know what they are I'm talking about? Um, I quote no. them all the time, and I'm just drawing a blank. Disciplined people, disciplined thought, and disciplined action. Mm -hmm. That's what creates significant movement is being a disciplined person with disciplined thought, and then taking that person, it starts with you, then it starts with that thought, then it moves into disciplined actions, right? The greatest break that I see in most of all of us is taking it from here's my dreams to my goals, getting to my monthly even, and then just continually just drawing down into more goals rather than creating that movement of measurable movements. Yeah, I think I have this right that one in two businesses fail, um, and that is an alarming number, but a fact nevertheless. So it tells you how hard it is to really, you know, go out there in business and, and be successful. It, it, uh, it requires a great deal of discipline and, and, uh, and stick to it mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, determination. So uh, I'll, I'll give a lighter example, right? I mean, I you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for years I, I, I drove around uh, uh, the city of Baltimore and all around the Eastern Seaboard with clubs in my car, golf clubs in my car, and I, and I never did, you know, because I didn't didn't have a plan, didn't stick mm. to any type of plan. <laughs> and uh, finally, when I got to, to Tampa, though, I was like, you know what, enough of that. I'm going to uh, do what's necessary. I'm going to take a series of lessons. I'm going to practice a couple of times a week. And I'm going to stick with that until I know I'm ready to go out there on the course. And uh, it, it took a financial investment. It took a time investment. Uh, I let nothing stop me on my Friday afternoon, late afternoon uh, lessons. Uh, would l I would let nothing interfere with that. And uh, simply executed that plan. And, um, and today I can, <laughs> I can go out and at least I can be respectable out there, you yeah. know, on, yeah. the, on the golf it's course. Fun. But it, it was, you know, it, it was a mental determination. And it's hard to, you know, not anything uh, earth shattering here, but as Arthur Ashe said, it's can you do it? Mm -hmm. Will you really? You gonna stick to it? Go all the way with it. Mm -hmm. There's where the, I think the wheat separates the the chaff, and um, no chaff separated from the wheat. That some individuals I think are just naturally stronger in that area. That's why I think kind of to your point. Uh, it takes a team where you have certain talent and skills around you. Yeah. Uh, and some, some are great visionaries and, and uh, excellent in, in the dreaming. But then there are others that are strong in execution, and mm -hmm. they can plan, and they can, they can do the administration to drive mm -hmm. something forward and just have that natural ability. So it takes a team. It does. Really to, it does. all right, let's Absolutely. do this together. I'm not good at executing, mm -hmm. personally. Not naturally good at executing. I, mean, I don't know. I look around and I just exactly see see <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Everyone, I know what it was, and I see it today. Everyone goes, "What are you talking about? You're not good at executing. <laughs> you do th crazy things that is crazy hard to execute." And I tell you, I'm not good at executing on because I know what I'm good at. I'm good at executing with building a good team and staying together. I'm, at, I'm good at executing. Continually building in and important. adapting that vision, but I have to find my who's. Yep. I've got to find my team, because I I could have thought about this space just for an example on my own. It would have never actually happened if I wouldn't have seen my weakness. Say so this guy over here, he is better than me at mm -hmm. this thing. 
Yep. I need your help. Can you please help me? Right? And, and that's that, that sweet spot is realizing only way to, the only way you could actually do golf is to find somebody who is better at golf than you. The coach. The coach, <laughs> right? There's that something in the peer to challenge you in that. And then these pre, pre, your basic principles, it's, and it's that process of, of self-control is a hurdle that all of us struggle with, some more than others. And, and I'm, I'm constantly battling that personally. It's just like, right, how do I get into this? Because I am that very high dreamer, visionary, mm-hmm. easy. That's just easy. But Blaine, how about you? Like, what are some practical things that you do? Um, we didn't even talk about like your. I love your processes. That that method that you were telling me about is just really. But you are just very. Both of you guys are very regimented, and I admire it. On what you like, like one thing, the great takeaway I got for that. I set a time, and I let, I let nothing come between me, and that Friday lesson. Hmm. That was a big nugget. That so many of us, because there's distractions all over the world vying for our time, especially these things, mm-hmm. right? And it's, so there's, hey, there's a movie on a Friday that just came out. You want to go see that? <laughs> no, I set this, and I'm not going to miss this. And I think that right there is one of the cornerstones of actually achieving your goals and dreams is by having that rigorous, like, because I've seen you guys both do it. So why don't you talk on, I mean, because I love your method of, of focus and pro- well, process. Well, before we get that, to get to your other yeah, yeah, class. Yeah. Go ahead. Eat the Frog. So there's this wonderful book called Eat the Frog. It's a funny title. It is a funny title. But it's the whole premise of it is do the thing that you absolutely don't want to do but need to do. In the day, do it first. Mm. What it, whatever is uncomfortable, you know, what have, if it's, you know, if, if you don't like making phone calls, do it first thing in the morning. So the, one of the things down. I've gotten to do is do a to-do list. And then I'll pick the one thing that I just don't want to do but it's important. And I do it, and I kick it out of the way, and that way I can spend the rest of my day, you know, doing the other things that also need to get done, but I might enjoy. And in that way of doing that uncomfortable thing I don't like, out of the way, I can I can have the rest of the day. Now, how do you eat the frog? That's where the pomodoro comes in. Now, pomodoro was um, I can't remember the the author's name, but. The, the, it's called the Pomodoro Technique. So, uh, you know, Pomodoro is a time for tomato. It's a timer. So the original guy that came up with the technique, he was trying to think of better ways of studying. Now, science has now backed him, and it's a simple technique. You work for 25 minutes and take a five-minute break, and you work in that. And I do a hybrid. So my big thing is the Pomodoro helps me eat the frog. So if there's a task that I, that I just don't want to do, I'll set the timer. It can be as easy as cleaning the house, right? I don't want to do any of that, right? Or I, I don't want to clean the dishes. Set a 25-minute timer. Go do Clean it. dishes for 25 minutes. But do nothing else. And that's the whole mm-hmm. point of the technique. You do nothing mm-hmm. else. Now, sometimes you got tasks that you know, you'll get done with one thing. I'll just hit the next item. And then when that five-minute break happens, I can go, you know what? I'm going to take my five-minute break, and I'm going to enjoy it. But a lot of times... There's sometimes when you get going with something and you go, you know, I don't want to stop. And then I don't need the Pomodoros anymore. But the Pomodoros also help me if I feel like I'm going down a rabbit hole, so to speak, into a problem, right? I'll all of a sudden go, wait a minute. Maybe I need to set a Pomodoro, um, you know, 25 minutes to go. If I don't find something within that time, maybe I need to stop and just rethink. Um, maybe I'm going too far down. So it stops me from, a lot of times in programming and when you're trying to problem solve, you can get really into, you know, one way of doing things. And sometimes by setting that Pomodoro, getting that to kind of interrupt you and go, okay, if I don't get, if I don't solve this in 25 minutes, maybe the way I'm going is not the right way, right? So for me, a lot of it is just getting, um, you know, doing the things that are uncomfortable. Uh, I forget what, there, there's a book, um, that I'm reading right now called um, Can't Hurt Me. What um, is it? Can't Hurt Me. Can't Hurt Me. It's written by a Navy SEAL. And um, his thing was, you know, he was, uh, <clears throat> you know, his, um, he came from an, a, an abusive father um, and he got overweight and decided one day, I want to be a Navy SEAL. And they said, you can't do it and you're not smart enough. So he trained himself to do that, and his big thing was like, you know what? I sat in the mirror. I was realistic with myself, 
and I did the thing I didn't want to do. He goes swimming, you know, in the middle of winter, you know, didn't know how to swim, but did that because he knew he'd have to do that in the Navy SEAL training and said, this is what I want. And to me, it's, it's, it's a powerful story of perseverance of going, this is what I want. And I love and loving the journey to get there, you know, and setting those realistic uh, goals. But I mean, you know, it, it's, it's just an amazing story, but it's one of those also about a great story of, well, eat the frog, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. You know, like I, you know, I love my donuts. You know, so when I got, you know, diagnosed with diabetes, like, oh, well, I can't have donuts anymore, you know? It's like, well, that sucks. But yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things where I, I, if you gave me one now, I wouldn't think about I'd be like, no, no, thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with it, you know? It's one of those things where, yeah, at first, sometimes these eating the frogs are kind of hard, but sometimes they can become normal, yeah. you know, where you actually Absolutely. start enjoying some of these kinds of things, you know? Yep. I used to hate writing documents. I, I used to hate all of that. I used to, like... But now, you know, I once, well, I'll, I'll say getting started I still hate, but that's what the Pomodoro is. And usually once I start, you know, I have to, like, put boundaries in place for that. And, yeah, so that's how I get a lot of s stuff done. And it's also a good way of tracking my time. So, you know, when my boss goes, hey, where'd you spend your time? I can go, okay, I spent my time. These are the, where, where I put my time. Um, Again, it's a regimented schedule. Regiment is rigorous. You're being rig rigorous with that. You're right. setting up boundaries. You're setting up accountability, right? right? And then you're s succumbing to that authority, that system, that system authority in your life. And it's it's one of those things like that you need other people to support you sometimes to get that going, right? I mean, or did you guys just were rock stars at it out the gate? Did you guys have accountability partners and that helped you with that? Or I mean, how did you guys get to the point where you could practice? I'm going to set this thing where on Friday, no matter what happens, I'm going to that. Yeah, or, more, more yeah. natural for me. I mean, I, yeah. just, I'm, just, I don't take credit for it. It's God-given, yeah. you know, just the way I'm wired that I uh, have uh, an ability to turn that on and, 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 and awesome. do it. It's, that doesn't mean that, you know, no distractions or setbacks and those types of things, but uh, there's where I think, complimenting you know I, okay that's Corvelli and yeah. he's able to do that that's a, a, a gift mm -hmm. um, that is a gift he should be partnered with someone maybe as a part of a team that maybe yeah. doesn't have that gift yeah of course and and uh, <laughs> and we work together but for me it's it's mostly natural it's uh, the way I, I, I do things how about you Blaine is it natural for some things yes other mm -hmm. things no I mean, so break there's, always, there's always a struggle. I mean, it's just like, okay, you know, um, I walk every morning, right? Yeah. I've always loved walking, but I got out of that habit for whatever reason life happens mm -hmm. or what have you. And, yeah, I started making this part of my morning routine. Um, you know, uh, my morning routine, I get up and I journal. And that's also something that didn't come natural. I just started doing it, but it's almost like a meditation kind of thing. It's kind of thinking about my what did I do in my previous day? And a lot of times it's just a stream of consciousness, right? Um, or maybe thing, something I, I saw on TV and I was like, I, I, you know, or like a rant, right? I see something and I'm like, I, I think this is all wrong. Someone should have done that. And I, I get it out. A, yeah. lot of, a lot of times my negativity, but the journaling thing I've done for years now, I do it with a fountain pen. I, there's, there's a whole thing to it, right? I get, out, I get out my fancy pen and I write and it flows and I meditate <laughs> on it. And I've, you know, it's just one of those things, but... My morning routine also is me walking my dog. How hard was it when you first walking. got into it? Hmm? So I'm sorry to interrupt. You, you finish your thought. And then oh, I tried journaling for years and, and years, and I would start, and I would stop, start and stop. So you'd fail regularly? Yeah. What it, changed the fail from finally going, all right, failed, 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 failed. What finally clicked? Fountain pens. Fountain pens? No. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> all right, everyone go out. We have now started this new fountain pen brand. We got this. We got this. On Amazon, <laughs> we're a little back supplied right now, but they start at three hundred dollars. It's guaranteed it will. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> it's one of those things where you got to find the magic thing. Like for me, for for journaling, I, I kept trying it. I tried different ways. I tried mm -hmm. doing it on the computer. I type in it. Just didn't feel right. But once I started writing with a fountain pen, there was a flow to it. It was almost um, 
I don't know, it's kind of meditative, like watching the ink kind of flow and then dry. And there's something like kind of old school about a fountain pen. You have to mm-hmm. fill up the ink. You get ink all over your hands, <laughs> and there's a messiness to it, but there's also this elegance to it, yeah, right? Yeah. And then there's a way you have, you have to learn how to write with it. You don't force it. You don't press it. You just let it flow, right? And just there's something about that that where all of a sudden it just clicked where I was like, I got up in the morning and I wanted to do it. And that's the thing a lot of times about eating the frog. Sometimes you got to find your way – of going yeah, to look forward to it. Because I wake up every morning, I'm excited to do my journal, I'm excited to go for my morning walk, mm-hmm. um, you know, yeah. and all of that. Oh, man. Yeah, so, so uh, all right. So we're running a little late because we started <laughs> late. Um, we're going to open it up. Cause this is a, are you guys having a good time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, guys, let's bring out the, the mic. We're going to do an open Q&A. Uh, we'll probably do uh, 15 minutes of this. It usually goes for 30, but we're, we're running. I mean, that was – you guys are rock stars. I, I admire both of you guys. Um, Thank you. As someone who's – you know, it's – I'm constantly striving to – and I can, again, celebrating the progress. I used to hate to read. Absolutely hated reading. And now it's the very first thing I do. I roll it out of bed, pick up a book, and I read, I read a chapter. And I just go, this is awesome. I actually miss it when I don't do it. It gets my, you know, my focus, and it's just, sometimes it's just slowing down enough to decode that, you know, because mm-hmm. other things are harder to do, and that was very hard to do, but it started changing, and I don't know how many times I tried doing that, and I guess that's where the mystery lies, is I can't actually determine when I finally became successful, but with the thing I can determine from my own story and your story and your story, is that sooner or later, I just stopped, I, I just never quit trying i'd yeah. fail i'd I, I would try i'd get back up i'd analyze it retool it and the, do it again mm-hmm. find think, the fountain pen and right I, and i think mm-hmm. it's the way you, you define failure too it's I think, beautiful i think that yeah. was the hard lesson yeah you know you know there's a couple of hard lessons i've had one one hard lesson is failure is not failure it's just you learned a different you, you know you've learned a way of not doing something you and, that, and that's the way you got to look at it it's yeah. not failure you just learned a way of not doing something or something that didn't work mm-hmm. for you, right? And the second lesson that was, I think, one of those kind of epiphany moments is only you can make yourself happy. And so happiness doesn't come from a bigger house. It doesn't yeah. come from um, things. It, only you can make yourself happy. And it's like at any um, stage that you're in uh, emotionally, you know, um, it takes a lot of discipline to stop that and go, okay, why am I angry? And kind of set back and, and realize that and go, okay, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to succumb to that, but I'm the one responsible for this and I can't control anything in this life but my reaction. Yes. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of, when I was younger, I was always angry. It's like, why don't people do what I want to do? You know, but then when you realize you can't control anyone else, you can just control yourself. You know, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard pill to swallow. And then once you realize it, well, things become easy, you know, because you learn to let a lot of stuff go and go, okay, I, c- I can try my best. And then the, the other one is, you know, yeah, I, I'm going to fail. And sometimes it's my fault. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a run of bad luck. Sometimes <coughs> it, it's what have you. But Delicious. it's not failure. It's not something to feel bad mm-hmm. about. It's to go, okay, I tried that. It didn't work. I'm going to try something new. Like me trying the, the journal, right, failing a bunch of times, you know, me trying to lose weight. I knew I needed to lose weight. I knew, you know, before I even got diagnosed with diabetes, I knew something was wrong. And I go, I need a change. But nothing clicked. And then I read that book, and I was like, I'll try this. And it was a diet where it's like, I'll be on that diet for the rest of my life. And it's not, to me, a diet. It's now lifestyle. a lifestyle. Yeah. But it's, it's things like that, you know. And to me, it's just like, you know, I, I see a lot of people, you know, there's, there's a quote, and I, I don't know who said it. But the thing is, what matters is, you know, is not that you get knocked down, is that you get back up. And yeah. I always think of that that moment, you know, kind of like, you know, you know, the Rocky movie, right? Yeah, and yeah. I love these, like, the stories of, of the tennis player, right? I love those kinds of things where they were up against unsurmountable odds, and they kept their mental toughness. And even when they thought, okay, I'm down for the count, this is it, they got back up. And yeah. you, in every success story, you know, they never talk about the failures, um, Stephen Jobs failed several times before um, Apple took off. I mean, Disney was fired for not being creative enough at one of his early jobs. Think of that. Right? Think of that, yeah. 
Yeah, mind blowing, yeah. right? You're thinking, oh, you know, what? Wow. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, there's a there's a common trend there. It's that you, you if you quit, it's the only way you fail. Right. Is to actually stop trying. That's what I. That's I mean. It comes down to elementary aspects of just children. You either win or you learn. The only way to actually fail is to stop trying. Yeah. Sooner or later, you're going to keep hitting those rhythms, and something will stick. And unfortunately, people don't really like to hear that because there is no, there is no get rich or quick easy scheme to achieving these. But there are principles that you can apply. There are methods that you can start learning that'll help, and you can try them out and see if that works for you, and then just work through it. Let's see the Q and A. That's awesome. Did you guys have fun? Yes. yes. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. Not awesome. done. All right. Yeah. I'll enjoy this a lot. Yeah. All right. All right. Brian, or anybody up there? I'll see, let's see some light. Does anybody let's have any questions? We're going to turn the lights on? I th well, we can't see anybody, can we? We got, we lost a couple, a couple of people, but it's okay. It's okay. Oh, there, oh, there we go. There we go. All right. So we're going to do this maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, this is just anything you guys want to ask about this subject, about, and, and that's just, we're, Open forum. So you just raise your hand, someone will drop a mic to you. If not, then we'll wrap. Uh, so, when, <coughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. so and talking about um, goals, and, and this one relates to the medical um, issue. So when you have a life-changing um, medical issue, a medical scare, did that provide more clarity on the things that you thought were super important or did it drastically change what you thought was important at the time? Like, okay, I got to cut away from things that I thought were important, but now faced with this medical scare, no, no kidding. I got to jump on what's super important. Or were you crystal clear? Like, nope, what I'm doing is exactly what I need to be doing. Um, yeah, no, and, uh, when they showed me the needles, that brought all kinds of clarity. That brought everything, because before I was like, well, I'll tr I might try, I'm going to try this, you know, I'll try it out a little bit, but no, when they showed me the needles, I was like, nope, I'm doing this. And then I started tracking, and when I started seeing the weight coming off, I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to keep going with this. Um, you know, like, my daughter has a condition where, where her, her um, she's got brittle bones, osteogenesis imperfecta, and going through all the trials that she has, um, and going to meet other children with it, you know, that gives you a lot of clarity. For me, it's been a humbling experience because it's one of those things where, like I said, these children are the most positive people you'll meet in your life. And you look at them, and you know, they're sitting in a wheelchair, right? A lot of these kids are wheelchair bound. My daughter has been lucky enough to, to get treatment to where she can walk. But a lot of these kids are not. And to me, it's like you, very much walking through a children's hospital, you see exactly what matters and you know you know family friends you know people matter um the big houses and you know fancy cars it just that that stuff doesn't matter at all right it's all about relationships and keeping yourself healthy you know and um all, all of that so yeah i mean <laughs> healthcare. i mean it brought everything crystallized into into vision and also it also allowed me to say no to a lot of things you know you have anything with that question Well, I will add that, uh, yeah, you know, having faced a you know, pretty significant medical set of circumstances last year, or the last two years, um, it, it, uh, it, it's a combination, right? It, it's partly, I have to balance this now, maybe put on hold some things concerning the bigger picture and the dream so that I can deal with the circumstances and be healthy enough for the long haul. So that's a, that's a plan. That's a strategy. But at the same time, uh, so it's kind of, there was a great sense of urgency that flooded my soul around, all right, you've got to look at life totally different and see this for what it is. If you want to accomplish these things, you, you, you better start to, start to step in. So it was, it's like both those things. Questions. Yeah. So, I heard a lot of um, angling in from business desires, and then health came up because health scares will, I know, just grab you by the by the collar and get your undivided attention. I didn't hear too much on goals, like within relationships, like on being better at fatherhood or 
husbandhood or just, you know, friendship or sonship? Like, do you all have goals in those areas as well? I'll let you go first. Since I <laughs> <have time. laughs> That's his wife. This is his wife. That's... <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe a little, uh, a little probing on that one, uh, Carvelli. Uh, a little, yeah. little fish. A little, uh, a little <laughs> subliminal message. <laughs> Not so subliminal message. Okay. You know that's an interesting question because uh, you, you know, I'll speak for myself. You know, you can take kind of take that for granted that. Uh, that that is just naturally happening, that I'm here and I'm, the door is open and uh, uh, we're in relationship. You know me. Uh, and um, uh, that's not necessarily, that's true, but it doesn't mean that relationships shouldn't, uh, they change. I mean, you know, uh, no more teenagers, but children in their 20s and now going to their 30s. Uh, so I guess there's a, a roundabout way of saying there should be some of those goals, I think, uh, especially if things are pretty good, um, they seem to take a, a, a back seat, if you will, if I could say that. Not negatively, it's just, again, I've got solid relationships and I feel like, hey, I'm credible in this, you know me, family and friends, not so much. But uh, that doesn't mean that it, 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 that they shouldn't be in the realm of goal setting. So I'll say it like that. You're so right. It, you angle toward business and other things, mm -hmm. professional. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I that is becomes my my key filter because naturally, um, I want to focus on the most tangible, and that is usually the most measurable which is the dollars in my account, right? Mm -hmm. the, the t like that, that's what I want to measure towards. Um, for my systems, my infrastructure, that's why it starts with time, still measurable. But then, it, but then it, it starts, after time, it starts with what my life looks like, and that is all built about my, around my relationships, what I'm doing with my kids in that time, what I'm doing with my wife, what I'm doing um, in my – and that, that dictates then even – Hey, you know what? I want to I want to have this memory builder. I want to do this trip with with and, that, and that's something that I've been so grateful for about those plans and those dreams is that I know every November comes around and me and Gracie are doing a trip, just me and her. And we've done that since she was 4 and apparently now we're going to Paris this year according to my daughter. Mm. And so and my wife said not without me. And so my daughter negotiated and said okay so i'm 10 this year so mommy can come <laughs> right and, and mommy goes mommy ain't taking no for an answer i'm going to paris right <laughs> so you know god willing we'll, we'll be able to do that in the fall depending on how things but so the answer is if i don't prioritize it then i will not set the goal for it period because there's nothing wanting me to and i will miss that in a drop Right, mm -hmm. and so it's not a natural thing that we're going to do. We're not going to naturally prioritize our health until there's a crisis. We're not going to naturally, I mean, until you, unless you're building those rhythms as a young child, but you're you get exposed to and you begin to practice what what you're exposed to as a child, and it becomes that thing. But I don't think, I I think it's so much easier to be distracted by relationships because when they're good, they're good, and you go into a crisis mode when it goes, I'm done. Oh wait 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 we I thought we were good, right? And that so I, to me I think it's I did notice that that is one of the first things that I neglect when I get stressed and when I get focused, is uh, and that's where you're measuring, you know. So every I mean I've, I review my I review my ten year dream lines I review them monthly, and I can actually determine, oh man I actually know right where my priorities are because I'm checking off oh I, I achieved this I achieved this, you know what I didn't achieve, I didn't actually. I went on. I only went on two dates in the last two months. I'm supposed to go on weeklies, right? You know what I mean? Like, oh, and for me, that's my mechanism. I have to be able to. I have to be able to measure that that movement. That's what I loved about what you were saying. And you were saying like measurables. You have to create milestone movements. And what I found though is like you have to put on the entirety of your life though, not just your business. And so it was a great question, Kim, because it really is. 
And there's no shame in that. You just can, can look to what, what you can focus on for the next cycle. And I think that's, that's what will kill most people out on this topic is they don't stand back up again. They go, oh. Well, it's just like also, you know, getting back to the family, you know, taking people for granted, you know. Um, early part of my career, I was super focused on it, and, you know, that killed one marriage. Because um, it, it came as a complete blindside to me. I was like, well, wait a minute, I thought, you know, everything was good. Um, so, you know, I'm happily re- remarried. Um, and But that's been our focus is um, always, you know, do family dinners, you know. Everyone's together, no matter what. We always do family dinner. Um, you know, being together, you know, um, I make sure, you know, that, uh, that I, you know, I, it's, it's hard to measure those kinds of things cause you don't know when they're going to happen, but it's one of those things also, I make sure to make time for my wife and I make time, uh, you know, for my daughter to listen, uh, to what they have to say and things like that. Cause I don't want to get, you know, into another situation where I put everything ahead of that and then all of a sudden I'm blindsided, you know? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's in, it's one of those where yeah, you don't want to be, you know, to go, okay, I'm going to spend 30 minutes with a wife, and then I can go do something fun. Yeah, yeah, it's not that. <coughs> you know, being time with a wife, you know, that's not eating the frog, right? you got to make sure you don't do that. <laughs> um, you, you know what I'm saying, right? Um, yeah. Where you go, to me, it's not like a conscious thing where I go, okay, i got to, you know, i got, I got to, you know, watch TV with a wife. Or it's a priority thing. It's just, you know, I'm going to Because, you know, it, with my daughter's condition, I mean, w- when we, we kind of tag team, and we realized that real soon, but tag teaming meant okay we weren't tired and exhausted but then we had no time for each other and we would get you know the end sometimes we get to end of a week or something and go oh we hadn't really talked to one another Mm. um okay let's make some time for that you know once we get past this crisis you know uh, when you got those kinds of things and to me it, it just has to come natural right um you know it's like calling you know it's like calling your family right to make you know how how are they doing and things like that right yeah. Um, sometimes, you know, you get busy, you can lose, you know, sight of that, you know. Very easily. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Any, any other questions on this topic? Dr. V? Well, touch the question I was going to ask, I mean, how much do you think on a personal life that you give up for success, um, for the dream or the goals? Because sometimes we are chasing it and we... We, you, we blindsided and you wake up one day, the kids are going to college, the husband is outside the door, you wonder what just happened. Um, so my question to you is, I've been in practice um, for about 15, 16 years now, and um, being a woman and doing what I do, it's a constant restructure. So I remember when I started, the dream was um, what I saw, and then it became a learning experience. So. Um, you know, you see someone going through this and you think this is what it should be, this is how it's going to be, until you do, you're like, oh, six months, I'm going to be fine, and a year, I'm going to be okay. And then you realize along the way you have to kind of change your thought process, and you realize your dream is no longer a dream, it's a journey. So for me, that's the way I look at it. So if I'm taking a journey, it's not over until, you know, I kind of check out. So every day, I reinvent myself. But my question to you is, you were finally able to play golf. I got free golf lessons. I still haven't been able to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> did you find out, I mean, I don't know. I think you touched on it. Is it easier after the kids leave home that you can kind of concentrate on what's, you know, on doing things more, you know, for yourself? Because I find myself, I do set those goals. I do have the plans and everything until my daughter's plan comes into play. And automatically, everything that was me just goes out of the window. You, you have a point. And um, I guess the answer to your question is yes, things do become a little easier when the children move on and have their own lives and you have more free time. You know, we were, my wife and I uh, raised three children and, and uh, she uh, did a phenomenal job homeschooling those three children. And so, uh, there was a, a major investment of our time. So all the soccer and the ballet and the, uh, the, 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 you know, the piano lessons and the public speaking, 4-H, Maryland 4-H club stuff, and football and all baseball, you know, there wasn't a lot of time to perhaps pursue personal things for sure. But 
you're right. Uh, they're living in their own place now, and uh, it has opened up a whole nother world to focus on some things I always wanted to do. And so that's been that's been great. I feel like I, I earned that <laughs> by not uh, putting the cart before the horse, not focusing on me, uh, but uh, putting myself uh, in the background and making sure I could invest in them uh, so I can do what I do with a clear conscience. But uh, I can certainly understand I've been able to get to those lessons yet if there are, pe if there are young people in the home and uh, you only have them for a short time. Uh, before you know it, they're gone. And so uh, you dare not, um, you know, uh, want to have the right priorities there. So you'll get to those lessons. I can tell you where to, where in Tampa to go. I can give you, I can tell you my coach's name and, uh, and, and give you an address as soon as you're ready. Uh, just just see Corvelli and, and uh, <laughs> before you know it, you, we can go out there together and go to, go to Rogers Park, yeah. do nine holes yeah. or go up to Rocky Point. Do nine holes, but it, it's it's season. My wife always says seasons. Yes. And there was a season of heavy demand, and I, I rose up to that demand. But uh, thankfully, new season. Here I am. Yes, sir. We're, we're wrapping up. One more question, if any. All right. You guys have fun. This is good. Yeah, this is this yes. is a fun one. Thank you guys for being a part of this. Thank you. And uh, and and so we're the next the next one we're having is um, still in the same series, but it's going to be on motivation, growth systems, and execution, uh, specifically within um, business strategy, leadership, and entrepreneurship. And the next guest is actually Josh Wise. He is the new CEO of Office Pride, and uh, just a fantastic leader, and uh, and, and and business uh, just business guy. And uh, I'm, I'm working on one more sea uh, level guy that, uh, that I'm trying to get, talk him into. These sea level guys are hard to get uh, uh, on board a little bit, you know. But uh, so, so just tune in for next week or next month. It's um, it is uh, on February 23rd. So appreciate you guys. I know this one went a little longer. We start a little bit later, but uh, one more thing though, one more very important thing. We have to sing Happy Birthday to a very special man here, Corvelli. And <clears throat> we got you a cake. Aww. We did. We did. We did. And it's a small one. I don't know how we're going to split this, but we're going to oh my in some goodness. way. All right, so everybody join with me in singing Corvelli, uh, his first 25th birthday, a happy birthday. Is that ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Corvelli. Happy birthday to you. Yes. Oh, wow. You guys are too kind. Look at this. <laughs> oh, am I going to blow out the camera? Oh, there we go. There we go. Oh, oh please be trick candles. Please be trick candles. <laughs> oh, they were in trick candles. Oh. oh, man. Thank you. you Hold on. To you. All right, guys. Thank you for coming to Crest. Uh, this is, uh, wraps up uh, another Crest chat. Blaine. Awesome, poor Bella. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank nice you to guys. meet you. Man, Thanks nice for telling me your story. Awesome. All right, go, glad to meet you. Likewise. Yeah.